Hello audience, wherever you may hail, I'm your host John Bruni. Welcome to The Focus, where we bring you the most thought-provoking and informative current affairs analysis from around the world. Each episode, we invite top experts and analysts to share their insights on the most pressing issues of our time. From international relations and global economics to philosophy and science, no topic is off limits. Join us as we explore the complex and ever-changing landscape of the world where we provide valuable perspectives on the events that shape our global community. Today we'll be speaking with Dr. Nisha McDonough from Edith Cowan University, otherwise known by its acronym ECU, out in Western Australia, on the phenomenon of fringe shoring. Nisha publishes original research on international business and trade issues, including how domestic reg regulation, international trade agreements, and geopolitics impact the international business environment. In addition, he teaches courses on international business at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels in ECU's School of Business and Law. Thank you for joining us, Nisha. Thank you for inviting me, John. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. So, Nisha, let's start by defining what fringe shoring is. It's a relatively new term that seems to be gaining popularity in international relations, trade and commerce. Can you give us a, an overview? Indeed, I can. So, look, that term, the specific term has become kind of mediatized uh, since April 2022 when Janet Yellen used it in a speech and, and set off a bit of a frenzy. But the idea has been around... Uh, quite a bit longer over the past decade and, and really gaining in intensity over the past five years. So when we talk about fringe shoring uh, between nations, it's, it's this idea that you organize supply chains that are now uh, currently globally spread out according to the logic of economic efficiency only, which can create vulnerabilities if those supply chains are in certain countries. Uh, so now the government is trying to step in and say, we want to reorganize global supply chains according to a different logic. This time it's going to be a national security logic or an economic vulnerability logic around those kind of areas. And often it's in relation to tensions with China, as we know, because China is now at the center of a lot of global supply chains as is, and is a very important uh, manufacturer and obviously has massive amounts of trade centered around it. So just what I would say there as well, John, fringe shoring is often kind of laughed at in some sense by some analysts that say, well, look, fringe shoring, what can that mean? Nations don't have friends, they only have interests. So the concept is all off to begin with. And so, look, that, that's kind of a banal response that I hear, hear all too often. When governments talk about fringe shoring, they're not on about the type of friends that have barbecues at the weekend, John. They're talking about relationships with other countries that are based on longstanding partnerships, often military alliances, and also that there's established levels of high trust based on past interactions. So that's really, I know Janet Yellen used this term, that's kind of easy to remember and so forth, but that's what governments are talking about. French Shorn is an intensely geopolitical and international relations based concept. It's clear eyed, and governments know what they're doing and know what they mean, and it's completely embedded in traditional balance of power and, and national security considerations. So essentially, if I if I get you correctly, then yeah, friend shoring really is a way of aligning our strategy and political interests with our business interests. Yeah, and and in a way, sometimes they will conflict. All right, so yeah. that's where the problem therein lies, because uh, commercial logic and economic logic, business, private businesses say, where can I do something at best cost? And that's most appropriate for my business. And that may be good for them. But when many businesses make the same decision and locate certain important critical inputs or even technological inputs in a, in a country that creates on aggregate a national security issue for another country who may need to then rely on that dependency, that's where the issues arise. So often French sharing might have to combat economic logic and actually interfere with the decision making of private firms who may be operating solely and naturally according to their own business interests. 
Hang on a sec. This sounds like there's a conflict just there, right? I mean, I, I'm a capitalist. I like making money. I like seeing money pour into my bank account. But I am not an economic rationalist. And an economic rationalist will see things very differently. They will see money as the ethical and moral foundation upon which everything is built in the world. Hmm. Now, if you have that mentality, surely you don't like business reigning in on your, uh, no, government, I should say, reigning in on your parade and suggesting that you ought to trade with country X rather than country Y, because at the moment we're having problems with country X. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, this could, this is a kind of traditional cleavage in, in liberal democracies between the role of the government and intervention versus those who want minimum government and they want market, everything, everything in the business sector to be led by commercial logic and, and private enterprise. But uh, look, businesses in the mainstay do understand that we're in a very different geopolitical environment. Some businesses are actually um, fringe shoring or reshoring, domestic shoring. They don't call it, it's not fringe shoring for businesses, but businesses are relocating out of higher risk countries, depending on the sector and the activity to lower risk because they know sanctions could be coming down the line. They know that the gov governments are taking national security issues very seriously at the moment on all sides, whether it's in Washington or Beijing, and that businesses will get caught in the crossfire. So some, some of these changes in international supply chains are actually being driven by businesses quite a fair bit because businesses drive more, the vast majority of international commerce anyway. And then the other part of it has been driven by governments. And obviously enough where some of those regulations push or cut off some some opportunities for firms like big banks on Wall Street who want to continue continually want to get into the Chinese market, for example, they they will push back if it's against their interests. And then you just have this domestic political economy of can the lobbyists for the big businesses kind of water down national security, can the defense sector and the national security cohort push back against that? And there, those dynamics are happening in Washington all the all the time and in the EU in relation, for example, at the moment to uh, uh, considerations on new regulations for outbound uh, capital flows and outbound investment screening, which is completely historically novel, John. So there's, there's definitely major tensions, but at the same time, the private sector does has gotten the sense that you, they're not going to push back against this in the, in the whole. They might win small battles here and there, but the ground is shifting and national security will come up trumps in a lot of key areas and is which we'll get into some of the examples as we carry on this conversation, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, look, uh, interesting that you said all of this, but here in Australia, of course, we march by a different beat completely. I mean, we we basically uh, went to the Chinese lock, stock and two smoking barrels when the going was good. And I think that of all the Western countries, Australia has had it the hardest in terms of trying to work out their own alternative arrangements to China. I mean, you know, the Morrison government was quite adamant about, you know, we are part of the Anglophone sphere. Strategically speaking, China is a threat to us. So therefore, we need to do things to protect Australia. I mean, that was the political speak. But there was that business community pushback where, you know, businesses who are politically savvy, influential, try to yeah, I wouldn't say force the Morrison government's hand, but at least uh, put the hand behind the back and say, "Listen, this is not in our national interest because if I'm making, if I'm not making money, it's not in Australia's national interest." And you got operators like, well, I, I hate to raise the obvious point, but Nisha, you're in Western Australia. You've got uh, a couple of arch capitalists who live in Western Australia. They have some very strong views on their relations with China. I'm thinking of Gina Reinhardt in particular and uh, the whole iron ore empire that her father had built. I don't see her pushing a particular barrow to not trade with China, especially with regard to iron ore, which is a strange thing from a strategic perspective. Because of course, when you look at China's military, a lot of the iron ore that comes from Australia as a raw product goes to China, gets refined, and then gets turned into Chinese missiles, warplanes, ships, and the like. A strange position. No, that's absolutely right. I, I mean, it's going to be in a moving feast. There's going to be ongoing um, debates and questions whether one particular policy has gone too far 
mm-hmm. from the business community and pushback, then the security uh, community will say things aren't going far enough. And they're working off different logics. And, and ultimately, the politicians are going to have to try and find a balancing point. And so, for example, look, in uh, 2023, uh, the Labour foreign minister, Kenny Wong, so this is what she had to say, right? And I think it cuts to where a lot of countries are at. Um, So I quote, we're not going back to where we were 15 years ago in relation to the economic relationship. We know that we want a more stable relationship with China, but we we know we're not going to be able to continue to separate our economic and our strategic relationship. So what does that mean? The minister asks, and then she states, it means Australian producers, whether barley or wine, are going to have to look to diversify markets. And that's one of the things the government is working on with industry, is to continue to diversify markets. Now, that's in relation to standard commercial goods, just so that you, you, those, those sectors aren't heavily at risk of economic coercion. We know here in Australia, China has heavily leveraged Australian export concentrations in China to use to shut off those markets using um, administrative measures that are hard to challenge in the World Trade Organization to punish Australia for having political positions that China doesn't like. And this is kind of gray zone political pressure because it's very hard to deal with in, in a legal sense to prove that the administration measures were politically pushed. Uh, the Institute for International Trade um, had estimated that this the coercion from China over the last few years in barley, wine, rock lobster, wool, timber, it was about 20 billion uh, in potential losses. And after some market diversification occurred, there was still, they've recently calculated Australian businesses lost 11 billion. This is a huge figure. It's very serious. And Australia is not the only country that's experienced this kind of coercion. So that's one reason why, why countries are being encouraged by government businesses to diversify. Don't have all your eggs in the China basket. Now, if we look at this a bit broader, John, the G7 and uh, Ursula von der Leyen recently had discussions on this. They talked about the concept of economic de-risking. They're basically basically saying something similar to what Penny Wong in Australia is saying. Look, the China relationship has changed. We're not decoupling. We're not going to, into a Cold War type situation of separate economic blocks. We're realizing that's not really feasible and won't happen. I, in my opinion, wouldn't happen unless there's a full on war, which we hope doesn't ever happen. So they've, these these leaders have said we're going to economically de-risk the relationship. So some diversification of heavily concentrated general commodities. But these are not national security risks per se, although they can lead to political influence from a foreign government onto your domestic government. But more so, they're talking particularly about critical technologies and critical inputs like critical minerals that are important for technologies. They're the ones that they need to de-risk and deconcentrate or even get away from China or originated supply altogether. And that also links to the Biden administration's and Jake Sullivan's concept of the small yard with a high fence, which is basically saying we would cut off these very strategic sectors, which are a small component of the relationship. And the rest is going to largely in the medium term continue on as is. All right. So and then that's the that's the public sector. And then the private sector is making its own calculations. All right. So I'll give you a good little um website to see on this, John. That would be Kearney's reshoring index. Kearney's in the US are a type of consultancy, and they've yeah. been tracking for the past decade the private business sectors um, shift towards a reshoring approach or a, or a nearshoring approach. That means they're getting out of Asia, low-cost countries, including China, for geopolitical risk. Some of it, some of it's for economic reasons. Costs are going up in places like China. Wages are going up. And some of it is about getting closer to your home market for uh, speed to market dynamics. So there's a mix of geopolitics, economics, and technology, which is all drive and reshoring. But the geopolitics trend is getting more powerful. And basically, Kearney's are showing that um, there's a big uptick. It's quite a, a bit of a volatile index, but in the past year, the, uh, two years, there's been some big upticks. And also what they do is they do a survey on CEOs, regular survey. And so on their most recent uh, CEO survey indicated that 96% of CEOs right, are evaluating reshoring their operations or have decided to reshore or are already reshored. Right. So that's an increase from 78 percent in 2022. So the big winner and that's all based on the US. Right. So the big winners there are, are Mexico. Actually, that's the biggest winner because they're part of that big North America free trade block. So businesses are driving a lot of changes. 
governments are driving a lot of changes. All right. But is this the free market or is this now the government kind of showing the way that the market isn't as free as it once was? Look, I, I, I'm always cri uh, critical of this kind of very simplified notion that there's the free market and there's a, uh, there's a government intervened market. Every market on this planet that's not illegal, not a black market, is a regulated market. The most <laughs> developed economies that are the most dynamic have the most regulations. Most regulations stabilize the economy. They protect, protect consumers, but protect businesses as well from having to go into race to the bottoms, for example, right? If your competitor is hiring children because they're cheaper to hire and they're easier to manipulate, and there's no law in your country against hiring children, they'll kind of force you to have to do that to be competitive on a cost basis, just for an example, right? Or if you're spewing your pollution into the local river because it's cheaper to do that, and there's no laws against it, then everyone will do it. So regulations overall are stabilizing the economy. Some regulations can be over, over, um, can over engineer that relationship. And sometimes governments in, we'll say, very interventionist economies are really trying to do business as well as kind of regulate business. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. But what I would say with some of these regulations is, they're actually trying to shape the market, but let the private sector do the work. And, I, and let me just unpack that a little bit for you, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you look at the European Critical Raw Materials Act in March 2023, so basically this is about reducing dependencies in that critical minerals input, right? Because China dominates up to 80% of critical minerals and rare earth mm -hmm. processing, um, extraction and processing to the, to the higher uh, midstream input product. So basically, uh, the EU has key benchmarks for 2030, and how they're setting it up is they want 10% of the EU's annual consumption of critical minerals to have been extracted within the EU. So that means there's mines going to be opened up. 40% of the EU's annual consumption should be processed in the EU, so that's the value-add stage. And then they say not more than 65% of the EU's annual consumption of strategic raw materials should come from a single country. All right, so they're setting these benchmarks, but they want the private sector then to meet them. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is where government is just setting out the framework. This is the way that the market structure we want. So there is definitely intervention, right? Um, but they want the private. They don't. They're not setting up giant EU-led uh, state state-owned enterprises or state companies to mm -hmm. to do the work, right? They want yeah. markets then to say who's the most efficient to provide this, who's going to do the investment, which mines are the right mines to open. That should all be driven by market logics. And there's another example in the US, then the Inflation Reduction Act. So this is doing something similar. They're first of all in the US, they're going to have seven and a half thousand dollar subsidy for an EV. So that means you as an American consumer will get seven and a half thousand dollars off your EV. That's nice for you. If you're a consumer in the situation whereby that EV has been assembled in North America, yeah, US, Canada, Mexico, free trade block. And in 2023, 40% of the critical minerals in that electric vehicle must be from North American free trade block or a free trade partner, such as Australia, for example. Right, right. And that goes up 10% each year to 2027, right? 80% by 2027. Now, whether or not they'll be hit, I think that'll be a big ask, but the trend will be towards hitting that 80%. And now, so again, the government's offering some subsidies, so that's definitely a market intervention. It's going to actually distort global markets to some extent because it's going to press a lot of manufacturers to set up shop in America where they may not otherwise. And it's also going to drive um, business, to divert business from China. But this will be market led once they know what they have to do to start getting um, more critical mineral supplies in other parts of the world. Uh, well, it'll have to be actually in the U.S., not Mexico, Canada, or another free trade partner of the U.S. So that's how the governments are intervening. It's a mix of intervention. And then the markets must adapt uh, their own business operations to meet those criteria. Okay. I come from a security background. So fringe-shoring seems to be part of an overarching change in international behavior. Uh, I'm reminded by what famous historian, author, and commentator Professor Neil Ferguson has said, that we are currently in Cold War 2.0 with the People's Republic of China. I don't believe that you believe that. You're saying that we're in some kind of... Uh, 
dare I say, well laid out, balanced and regulated, uh, not confrontation, competition. Yeah, look, so the Cold War analogy has been bandied around a fair bit. And in, to some extent, it's useful. And in other ways, it can be misleading. And I'll just I'll, I'll draw why I think that's the case. So Cold War, two big great powers going at it head to head. They're ideologically in opposition to one another. Each side thinks that if the other side gets more global influence, it actually undermines their system as well, right? There's a yeah. systemic element to this. Either is authoritarian the better system, is democracy the better system? If you look at Chinese um, do government documents, they're seeing it in this light as well, right? And it, that this is this type of big systemic struggle the U.S. is that concern. So in that sense, and it's a bipolar conflict, right, and where others have to kind of get involved in terms of which side they're more supportive of in, in terms of military balancing, at least, right? Mm. So Australia and Japan are obviously in the U.S. camp in terms of regional military balancing. In that sense, it's heading in the Cold War. Uh, it is a Cold War type situation, but there's another sense where it's completely different. And this is the novelty of the era we're in. And it's where all my research revolves around. We're in this heavily interdependent, interconnected, dense system of global network, uh, production networks that were driven for 30 years on the concept of commercial logic and the private sector economic efficiency, which you mentioned. This was facilitated by China entering the WTO in 2001. That itself was predicated on the engagement strategy and the economic peace theory. So these were IR concepts that drove the US to really okay a communist command economy joining the world liberal economic order. Mm. And the idea was engage with China, economically intertwine China with the West. It'll keep becoming more like a democracy. It'll move in that direction. This was all tied up with ideas that um, liberal market economies and democracies went hand in hand because you had to give a certain amount of political freedom to allow people to be actually economically free actors, right? So the pressure would grow and grow. But obviously, China has been able to expand free markets in its in economy, layered over and, and under a massive continuation of the state economy. And also the state contain, has a legal governance system that allows it to intervene in every aspect of private economic life in a way that's unparalleled in the West. And that's where a lot of the economic risks and vulnerabilities arise. So China continued on its own path, which was to allow markets to expand, but maintain a heavy single uh, single party Marxist Leninist governance system. Right. And that's very that's very clear from Xi's ter term is basically it's a revitalization of Marxism and the ideological components of that and the control of the state over the economy. So in that sense, you have these great powers that are completely intermeshed. They are dependent on each other economically in the sense of the size of and scale of flows. Last year, nearly $700 billion of goods merchandise flowed between the U.S. and China. All right. This is after, what, four or five years of intensifying geopolitical tensions. Yeah. Right. So this is unparalleled. And every other and Australia, key, key ally. Uh, it's on if you're thinking about uh, Cold War military blocks, it's clearly in the U.S. camp. At the same time, it's having continuing dialogues today with China to stabilize the political relationship because China is its biggest export market, as it is for many other countries, but either on the import or export side. So everyone has to keep dealing with everyone. Everyone has to play nice to a certain extent, and everyone's balancing how far they're pushing the national security logic while trying to maintain the big and very important economic relationships that no side want, could afford to cut off completely, say, tomorrow or next year, right? So even though the trend is a slow decoupling, uh, it's not decoup It's not governments aren't trying to force two separate distinct blocks. They know that's not possible in any kind of re a reasonable time, time frame, if at all. You know, within this overarching interlinked system that we've currently got i mean there are a couple of things that flow from it but you know as the conversation continues i'll hit you with 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 a couple of things but the first thing of course is you know there's been a lot of stuff being said recently about the strength of the chinese economy based on what um famous geopolitical commentator peter zian or zion i should say um has mentioned and that is there that china is facing a demographic collapse and you know as as countries have a proliferation of aging populations, 
obviously markets then start reducing in size because if you only have, you know, like half as many consumers, young consumers who want to buy the latest gadget and stuff, say 25 years from now, uh, we're not dealing with the same sort of entity as we have been dealing with 25 years earlier when China was a much larger economy and had more people to consume things. So how does that very real problem fit into everything that you've said so far? Because so far, it seems that we've got politicians who are happy to play these kind of very complicated games. I mean, honestly, being a uh, having had a political uh, life at some point in my early career, I uh, I will say that I have grave doubts that any politician, whether in Australia or anywhere else, will really be able to do the right thing by their country. It's just we're not getting the right quality of people through the system, if you ask me. But anyway, that's just my personal opinion. You've got um, uh, a very complicated set of equations that you're having to constantly juggle in order to keep everything stable. Now, Nisha, there's obviously the the point, and it's a national security point, but it's also an economic point here. And that is, if China has reached peak China, and from here on end, China becomes smaller very rapidly, and we cannot manage that country's decline for it, and the autocratic system within China can't manage the decline well, are we not facing a major national security crisis globally? as a consequence of China not being able to sort of sustain itself? Yeah, look, I think that's uh, a future that's beyond my uh, crystal ball gazing to give any definitive answer. And I think anyone's done, because as you said, the complex mm. set of equations there are are too, are too much of a hurdle. Look, I think what we could say with some sort of rational basis is that, yeah, China's peaked in terms of its speed of growth. Because as any economy develops, its growth has to slow down because all the main processes, urbanization, growing consumer markets, increasing levels of um, consumption being possible by growing income, the, the build out of infrastructure, all that sort of stuff obviously has a boom initially and then slows down. And China actually developed at the perfect time when there's this global economy that's ready to just invest and then absorb all its output right so much harder for example britain as a leading one of the first industrializers who you don't have a global consumer market to sell stuff to you britain was growing at one percent a year throughout mo most of the 19th century right whereas china grew 10 percent a year throughout most of the 80s 90s and early 2000s that era is long over china will be lucky to grow at three to five percent i think in the next 10 years um, and we even have some incredible, credible data that has looked at proxies for economic growth that even says that some of the, at least some portion of China's growth over the last 30 years was overstated um, by maybe a few percentage points. So, so still, if you're at 10%, maybe it was eight, still a massive growth rate, but it was overstated um, and it's slowing down. The demographics are against it. So the standard economic processes would slow it down anyway, but demographics are going to be a big headwind but i think it'll be fairly slow burn at the same time it's still um and a 20 it's almost a 20 trillion dollar economy now at the moment it's going to be the second largest economy uh permanently in, at least in my lifetime there's no one's gonna you can't see anyone india for example would be the only one that might pass it out i doubt that'll happen it'll be a slow burn problem um, the economy has also been long, at least five to eight years, at this major inflection point where it needed to transition, John, from an infrastructure and investment-led economy to a consumer-led economy. The consumption, the consumers are only about 40% of China's economy compared to 80 in the US, and maybe 70 to 65 average across the EU, for example. <clears throat> now, the reason why you can't transition, John, is pr primarily because the government is so in control of the economy overall and wants to be there's it, it doesn't allow capital to go out as capital controls on money in and out it anytime the economy hits a bump the government can just say okay we're going to get soes to keep hiring people whether they need them or not we get them to invest we'll push out lending through the banks we'll just make them give businesses money whether it's good business or not and in this sense the kind of all the issues that are in a communist command economy of the government just saying make it work actually live on in China, in China's modern hybrid mixed up 
free market slash uh, command economy. And they just keep, they used to just keep throwing money at it, right? And a lot of this is bad malinvestment. It's bad investment. It's bridges to nowhere. It's cities that never get the populations they were expected to have. They're knocking down buildings again and so forth. So that doesn't work for them anymore. And they have massive debt, something like 300% of GDP in debt across the whole economy, public and private. This is vast. A lot of it's hidden. Shadow banking, unregulated uh, lending and so forth. And they got even the government now knows at this stage, the party, that they can't just get out of their current malaise by firing money at the economy. There's too much debt. And they're probably heading for a massive debt crisis in the next five years. So this crisis has been predicted for a while. I know that hasn't happened, but everyone thinks the conditions are there now. And we see with their post-COVID recovery, it's been very slow. So in saying all that, it's still a vast economy. They still will plow plenty of money into the defense. Um, how much political instability that will generate this economic slowdown remains to be seen. There's very high youth unemployment, it's over 20%. Um, so look, there's a lot of things going on, but we've seen other big economies, John, stagnate for long periods of time without falling apart politically. Russia is a great example of that, mm -hmm. right? So we can't assume that this will mean China will implode or become more risky, for example, as, as sometimes it's suggested or that it, it'll have to take its Taiwan gamble soon because it's hit comp its peak in, in building its national comprehensive power. Its power, will, its military power will continue to grow over the next 10 years because they keep plowing the money in, they'll prioritize building that up. So that's what I would say. It's definitely hitting headwinds. Um, we just have to see how China manages that internally. Maybe it'll take its energies away from international provocation and make it refocus on domestic reform, which is badly needs. What would that actually look like, Nisha? I mean, if you've got Western companies that really formed the basis of China's economic miracle since 1978, packing up and leaving for parts unknown, Mexico, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, and a whole swack of other countries, what, what does that actually mean? I mean, China can't replace those uh, Western uh, companies uh, the uh, state-owned enterprises uh, are not savvy enough or innovative enough uh, to create their own space and fill that niche. So, so obviously, what you're saying, yes, I, I, I see what you're saying, but can can China rectify itself uh, under these conditions? Because unless you can generate a geopolitical uh, alignment that is stable for the duration. And we have a detente between the United States and China that can facilitate this. Western companies now are going to be very skittish about moving back into China. They may see great things for them if they do so, but would they really want to go and take that risk only to find out that the CCP is up to its old tricks again? Yeah, look, there's two things I'd say there. Um, there's still a lot of interest from external foreign firms in China, right? It's still got this massive growing middle class. It has a massive existing middle class, a lot of millionaires. Uh, the European luxury export market is booming in China still because when consumption drops, it's often the middle class kind of lower whose consumption of um, unnecessary goods will drop. But the, And this is the global phenomenon. The wealthy just keep spending currently, yeah? on these kind of luxury goods. So that's that's still massive. But a lot of ch companies are in China for China. That's how they put it. So what, what you'll see is that businesses are separating their China operations from their other international operations. That's kind of what, what's happening at the moment, whether it's in investment, hedge funds, manufacturing. And interestingly enough, John, even Chinese manufacturers, are some of them are relocating to Vietnam, Chinese mm -hmm. businesses, to avoid geopolitical issues. And so they're right. just exporting from Vietnam. The other thing I'd say is there's a lot of big dynamic Chinese companies, private, private sector. So when their economy developed and the, the reins on the private sector were loosed, they really did uh, build a lot of domestic champions. So in the in the um the financial innovation area and consumer, Alibaba, Tencent, these kind of companies, they're they're global leaders in what they've done with their apps, these kind of super apps. And that others are trying to replicate and TikTok, for example, as well. So there are like, and that's part of why the party feels more secure and pushing its political programs and saying, well, if we lose some Western companies along the way, that's now tolerable because we've built up our own mar internal market enough and we have dynamic Chinese companies. And in, way, in a way, that was part of their plan 
particularly for high tech sectors, is to get the, the technology transfers and then you start squeezing out those overseas companies through different, again, the administrative procedures, you just make life hard for them. This has long been a concern of the EU and the US and Japan, that this the, the market access is often given strategically and then closed to, to get the transfers, to get the capital, build up the market, then push people out again. So in saying all that, Micron, who was, uh, that's the US maker of memory chips, they were recently security reviewed by the party seen as retaliation for some of the American export controls and they were banned from any critical infrastructure projects and I, even after that happened they've announced uh, I think it's a six to eight hundred million investment in, a, in expanding chip making in China in not the not the high-end chips but lower down but still that, that, that was quite an interesting report saying look this micron's been sanctioned in China but they're still investing and expanding their operations so as I said, look, it's a very like dynamic, complex set of cross-cutting interests that are what make this era of geoeconomics, we call it, great power politics by economic means or the logic of war and the grammar of commerce, as Edward Lukpat said in the 1990s. It's so dynamic, John. It's so different in that sense to the original Cold War. Um, and, and I think we're everyone's struggling with it. Businesses are, governments are. But there is a steady kind of coalescing on where governments need to be in liberal democracies, at least, which is de-risking and just carefully unpacking a small, a narrow subset, but very important subset of international commerce, commerce in strategic sectors, critical inputs. And that's where the focus will be, I think, over the medium term. I'm John Bruni, and you're listening to Sage International's The Focus podcast. And from Perth, Western Australia, we're speaking with lecturer on international business, Nisha McDonough. Nisha, um, it was interesting hearing all of that, and yet something keeps on cropping up with me. Japan was one of the was an early adopter in terms of investing in post-Maoist China, right? So once the Chinese economy opened up after Deng Xiaoping decreed it. The Japanese went inside there, all guns blazing, and I would imagine dominated uh, the the internal market of China. Uh, you know, in order to develop it in a way that would be friendly disposed towards Japan's economic interest for the duration. But when we're talking about de-risking and we're talking about friendshoring, how does a country like Japan, that's just off the coast of China, Deal with the fact that you've got this country that strategically is problematic, but you're still making lots and lots and lots of money. Does Japan see its economic power within China as a means by which it can control things? Or is it uh, that the CCP now is all dominant within the Chinese economic and political space and foreign companies, governments that have made their mark within China are no longer that relevant to China. Yeah, so if I remember Richard McGregor's book, Asia's Reckoning, is a very good overview and historical analysis of the deep, deep tensions and um, difficult history between China and Japan. And I think there's, a, and those two countries have territorial disputes over islands as well, the Senkaku, Daiyu Islands, depending on which side of the, of the waters you're looking at them. Mm. So I think Japan are probably more clear-eyed about the, the the risks and tensions any country faces with China because they probably face the, the biggest set of risks and tensions. Well, maybe aside from Japan or Taiwan. So. I think they're very real, realist and clear-eyed about what, what's happening in China and know the absolute limits of their influence to their economic investments, which are vast, as you said. Um, we can see Japan's massive shift over the last five years, even, away from its peace constitution, post-war peace constitution, yeah. to a much more activist and, and clear-eyed sense of what its obligations are in the, in the sense of the U.S. alliance and what its, what its requirements are to ensure its own safety, building up more alliances, uh, more in, intensified relationships with countries like Australia, allowing um, uh, Australian troops, for example, onto its, 
uh, on to, constitutionally allowed onto its territories. The only the only other country after the U.S. and Australia has reciprocated with that. So Japan's moving fast in and out of a clear sense of uh, threat, and also actually. The French are in uh, the Japanese will absolutely led the way and they didn't call it French are in, they called it China plus one. Right. Mm -hmm. So this was more about diversification. They've been doing this since the 2000s. Right. And really picked it up after 2010 when they were subject to Chinese export controls on critical minerals, which they really needed for their manufacturing processes. And China suddenly cut them off. And um, so they, they understood we really need to push our, like they'd push their private firms, provide funding, provide support, do as many, keep doing free trade agreements to diversify how much market access you have globally. The Japanese have been doing this for quite some time because they were already ahead of the curve in the sense, in the sense of saying, we're too dependent on China. This is a real vulnerability, vulnerability for us. We've been coerced economically. So we need to mitigate that. So I think we can learn something from that China plus one policy for sure that Japan has long espoused. And that's what a lot of the, like what Penny Wong's talking about is essentially with the telling pro Australian private firms diversify. That's a China plus one, because that's not a national security issue in terms of technology. It's just general commodities, but it's about not being dependent on this one market that can cut you off. And the government will probably support that with maybe some funding. Uh, maybe Austrade would be helping to, to advise um, to advise private businesses, especially the small to medium sized ones and what type of market access Australia has and where. And also they're continuing to negotiate free trade agreements as well. So all of this stuff is in the mix in terms of how you diversify from China um, and, and what's possible as well yeah, and, and opening up your options. So that's the safe sharing. I prefer safe sharing than French sharing because people think with French sharing that I think it just gets this kind of concept that it can be discredited because we don't nobody knows what a friend is in international relations <laughs> a lot of it is is about yeah. is about <clears throat> um just diversification and then once you get to the really critical technologies well a friend as i said at the start of this show really means someone you have a long-standing high trust relationship with right so obviously the us has that with the uk and now australia in a way it doesn't have with say the philippines even though the philippines is an important military ally they're not going to get nuclear submarines from the us ever right and nobody else probably would anyway britain was the only one since world war ii now australia so that's that's friendship in the sense of high trust long-term relationship you know, it's interesting you should say that because uh, I would go so far as to say there's still a big question mark whether or not Australia is going to end up having uh, nuclear-powered submarines, but uh, that's a yeah, story no, for another time. That's a different story, <laughs> but I, I know. It does big but, but I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Look, um, with regard to friend shoring, you make the point that high-trust countries often like to sort of stick together and are making this happen more and more often. But of course, with friend shoring, it's all about economics and what you can get away with in terms of maximizing one's profits and minimizing one's overheads. So you would find many Western countries moving out of, say, for instance, China and going off to another autocracy. Now, the, the problem here, of course, and being a you know political science guy, as my background is, I always have to go back to politics as my default setting, Nisha. I'm sorry about that. But, you know, when you're looking at things from a political perspective and you've got your economic eggs diversified among a number of illiberal democracies or strong autocracies outside of China, outside of the control of the CCP, surely that's not sustainable, right? I mean, surely if politics is going to trump economics at some point and is always going to be the, the, the point at which we always have problems with other countries, uh, don't we have a problem here? Well, not necessarily. And, but again, it goes back to what's your concept of French sharing and what's the purpose driving it, Right. Right. As uh, what we're talking about today, the French sharing we're talking about is geopolitical safe sharing, solely focused on one country's dominance and in certain supply chains or potential dominance for certain critical inputs, and that's China. And it's based on geopolitical tensions between the US, the EU, and US allies primarily wanting to diversify. Now, when they want to do that, that doesn't mean they're not they're concerned about diversifying, say, let's just say Vietnam. So you can say, well, Vietnam is like China, it's a communist country. 
but it's not it's sort of there's no geopolitical fear of coercion uh, or of of militaristic conflict with Vietnam. So if your friend sharing initiative is about securing yourself geopolitically, it's not value. This is this in this instance we're not talking about value based friend sharing. We're talking about geopolitical based friend sharing and national well, security. And if you, I, I, I go, I go. Well, one thing there. One thing. We often look at China's human rights record as something that is a bit of a stain on its capacity to manufacture goods. Say, for instance, Nike sneakers that come out of Uyghur sweatshops, just Mm. as an argument. Well, in a totalitarian state like neighboring Vietnam, for instance, their human rights records aren't particularly good. And I'm sure that there is also that that urgency to produce in spite of the cost to their own society, which again shows that there's a sort of a split view in terms of Western values on the one side and economic realities on the other. We all want to make money. So what do we do in this sense? Do we just say, well, we make money and that's the important point. And well, human rights, you know, we're talking about Vietnam here or Mexico over there or some other illiberal place. Do we really care about that? So, John, that's where you have to distinguish between geopolitical imperatives and human rights imperatives. And they're on two different streams and they're operating in somewhat different ways. All right. So the geopolitical safe sharing is about diversifying critical minerals, for example, because they're so core and important. They're important to military production. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. Your fighter jets, your high end technologies, your chips. There's loads of areas where of the highest national security importance that those critical minerals are vital for right so that's part of it there's Jude what's happening in the in many uh, liberal democracies at the moment as well is on is a separate track but it is this human rights focus and suddenly realizing that okay there's major issues in Xinjiang for example forced labor there's human rights issues in other countries as well that consumers are increasingly aware of that governments are being forced and Politicians are pushing for it as well, right? It's not mm. purely instrumental. Just politicians who are pushing this, uh, who are involved in this, believe in better human rights and are pushing what's called due diligence legislation. This is happening in the EU, in Australia, the Modern Slavery Act. In the US, the, you're not allowed to import anything from Xinjiang now. It's an area of concern, all right? So it's considered that there's high high likelihood of forced labor. So that whole area now is under sanction, okay? So that's one, that's one type of decoupling and reorganization of global value chains. And it's very important, right? Because as you said, there's lots of abuses. At the same time, there's countries at different levels of development. They won't have all the same, let's just say, the same standards in human rights. That's long been recognized. We've long been trading with countries. The working conditions are going to be uh, worse in Mexico than they are in the U.S. Some of that's just to do with economic development, right? You may not get overtime rights the same way. There'll be other conditions that will be different. But a lot of that comes with economic development and getting richer. Countries have long accepted that will that you, you can trade on those grounds and actually it'll help those countries get developed. But even in the recent when Trump administration renegotiated the the NAFTA free trade agreement, they actually did insert clauses to improve labor standards in Mexico and to require they would be allowed to do inspections, right? Mm-hmm. In factories in Mexico. So if Mexico's building vehicles or building parts that go into vehicles in North America, which they are, they're assembly, they're a massive uh, exporter of vehicles into the US with, without tariffs. That renegotiated agreement actually did have a big focus on better and higher labor standards in Mexico. They still won't meet the American ones, but they're two different levels of development. So part of it is that. So I think there's two different things going on here and you're right to point to that. There's the geopolitical pressures and legislations being used for national security reasons primarily. And then there's another stream that is happening in the US, EU, Australia, Japan, saying we need better human rights. We're negotiating these into our free trade agreements. We're actually sanctioning some areas if there's a high degree of evidence that there's a bad abuses going on. And that's the value-based component. And there might be areas where they interact as well, but they are certainly two different streams. There's different political economies driving them. There's different groups and political interests driving them. So I think it's important to distinguish between those. Nisha, just um, we're going to be wrapping up soon, but uh, just a couple of final questions. The first one is to do with Taiwan and the centrality of Taiwan to the manufacture of, you know, microprocessors that are so fundamental. I mean, it's almost... I mean, to the to the modern economy, um, it is as 
water is to a human being. I mean, without the microchips, you don't get your computers, you don't get your smartphones, you don't get all the stuff that makes modern enterprise work. So with this peculiar geopolitical situation between China, or the mainland China and Taiwan, how do you see this play out? You know, there's been a lot of talk in the security driven media, which suggests that we're on the cusp of seeing some sort of act. It doesn't necessarily have to be a violent act by mainland China to finally uh, put its boot onto Taiwan. But say, for instance, you know, election interference in the upcoming uh, January 2024 Taiwanese elections, we could see more pro-China candidates get up. Uh, we could also, at the worst case scenario, possibly see a rerun of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but this time involving the People's Liberation Army Navy and the US Navy facing off over Taiwan and its islands. I mean, it seems like there are these, these touch points that are very difficult to actually get away from. But with Taiwan being so central to the global production of microprocessors, how do you think we can get above the the war talk and and come down to reality in terms of man if you're going to go after taiwan you're going to destroy the very thing that you covered and you're going to land a blow not just to yourself but the entire international community how do you how do you how do you get the ccp to process that reality well i think in the first instance i think it's unlikely in the medium to long term that any economic cost would ultimately fully persuade the CCP to on their ambition on Taiwan. I mean, they continually state that this is going to happen, has to happen. They won't renounce the use of force there. So I think everyone has to adapt to that. What you said, there could be a military conflict. We hope not. There could be. Everyone has kind of internalized that. And again, if this is where I can give you a good example of state led regular Regula regulatory intervention designed to reorganize global supply chains in this most critical of inputs as our critical product, the, the, the semiconductor chip. So Taiwan is at by far the leading edge. TSMC is its main company. Yeah. They're at the three nanometer um, chip production level. That's three billionths of a meter when you etch and, and, and space out the transistors. But uh, other, other countries are further behind. So Korea actually is probably on the five nano, about to get onto the three nanometer Samsung, very close to it. So there is some production. And then in the US, you'd have maybe five to seven nanometer, certainly seven nanometer, right? So they're not, not a world away. Now, what the US has done with the Chips and Science Act is throw massive amounts of money in an area where it does already have some reasonable capability and once led, Right. So basically, at the moment, there's 50 billion to be that can go towards in, uh, companies that want to invest. So that's a portion of their investment. So the 50 billion will in, in reality multiply many times. All right. So it's already since that Chips Act was announced, there's been 200 billion at least in announced new investments. Intel on its own has announced 20 billion, uh, 20 billion, right, towards two, two factories in Ohio. TSMC has announced 40 billion, all right, in Phoenix, Arizona. It's a massive expansion. So T TSMC are going to be involved in this. And basically, what's what the US is doing is saying we want to get up to speed with the fabrication. Now, there's an important point here, John. Fabrication is only one part of a very um, disaggregated supply chain. So the ver it was vertically mm -hmm. disintegrated, that whole supply chain for build for designing and building chips over the last 30 years based on globalization dynamics, economic logic, the US dominates chip design. Netherlands and Japan dominate the tool making part, which is the lithography machines, extreme ultraviolet in particular is a D Dutch specialty. Then you have fabrication, TSMC dominate there, Samsung are up to speed, Japan have some capability, so do the US a little bit behind. Taiwan, and then you have the two the packaging and testing, and that's that part of the supply chain. And a num numerous countries are up to speed on that, and it's not so technologically high end. So that's not a choke point. The other three areas are choke points. The US already can use its uh, chip design dominance to to actually get other allies. So recently, it got Japan and the Netherlands to agree not to export extreme ultraviolet lithography mm -hmm. to China. Right. Mm -hmm. So based and it has that card that says 
we won't give you the IP that you need to, to build those machines or what you might need for your own fabrication. In Japan, for example, we won't give you that. They may not have had to said that, but that's implicit, right? That we can mm-hmm. we can cut you off as well, but we need you to play ball. It should also be noted that it was Intel who provided the R&D and, and a lot of the research for ASML in, in the Netherlands to build extreme ultraviolet lithography. So there is a long-standing connection there because the US, uh, Intel didn't want to actually specialize in building the machines. They're so complex. I wanted to focus on chip design and chip fabrication, but it did give the technology to another com- company in a country that the US felt it could trust, right? This goes back to trust, mm-hmm. long-standing right. relationships and all that. They wouldn't have gave that technology to China even then because they were still, they were in good terms in the 2000s. But yeah, they're not going to give them this high-end technology. So I think what's happened, this is a, like probably holds some risk for Taiwan because maybe dominating in that fabrication is a good reason not to militarily intervene because you destroy the, the high-end chips and that will massively impact the world economy. But that's going to get diluted out now over time. Germany has announced a 10 billion subsidy package for Intel to expand in Germany, another 20 billion factory. You can see that the money required to be involved in chip fabrication is just so far beyond the the means of most companies and most countries even to even think about supporting. So there's a very few few amount of companies and countries will continue to dominate that. But it seems that supply chain is going to be reorganized. There's going to be more supply. The EU is trying to build more. The U.S. is definitely their de- the, the investment is already rolling out. They're building the factories already, so they will get up to speed in fabrication. Okay, so does this over time uh, make Taiwan less important to the United States and to the West as this diversification of microprocessing fabrication continues? I think potentially that's the the logical trend. If the U.S fully catches up and has a, a vast amount of capacity at the same level as what tai, Taiwan can, can can fabricate, that's the logical outcome. It becomes less critical in that global production network. Surely that must be that, that must send alarm bells and chills down the politicians in Taipei, right? I guess so. So the, re, the fact that TSMC is involved in this, maybe they're saying, well, look, if we don't take up some of this money, our competitors are going to get it anyway and we lose out. Whereas if we get in, we're still influential we're st- and they have a long-standing relationship with the U.S. So I think they felt they probably had no other choice, John, that the U.S. has gone down this path anyway. They're not going to be held back that just because TSMC don't invest, that's fine. We just give more money to Intel or we get Mike Brown up and running more mm. or whoever. There's a few other big U.S. Um, companies that could potentially ramp up and get involved. So they probably felt they had no choice, but it does have risks and it does um, reduce that kind of core, core centrality of Taiwan in the fabrication part of the supply chain. So finally, Nisha, China is changing. The world's relations with China are changing. But will China retain its position as the workshop of the world? Or now is the trust so irrevocably broken between the West and China that it just can't sustain that? Look, for now, it's still, without any doubt, the workshop of the world. And so the big investments that make that happen have massive sunk costs. So the unwinding of that type of manufacturing investment and relationship would be slow anyway. If you look at the foreign direct investment, that's that's a a forward-looking indicator. That's dropping off a cliff at the moment um, in relation to EU and North America inward into China. The investments are dropping off massively. The manufacturing will be much slower, but we also have to remember that China now is the central economy in in Asia, in Southeast Asia, but Asia more broadly, which is itself a whole booming, the fastest growing region with the fastest growing middle class. And to be quite frank, all those countries are and have to hedge their bets. Some of them them have their military alliances with the US, but they're still economically intertwined with China through Mm. RCEP, the regional agreement, the CPTPP as well. And they have to continue doing that, as indeed even Australia is. Yeah. So there's no real fear that China becomes deindustrialized in, in any decade soon. I, do, I just don't see that. 
because there's a lot of countries who don't have the value conflict, don't have the ideological conflicts with China that we have in liberal democracies or the values issue, and they have to hedge geopolitically and they need the economic income. They need China as well. They need their investment. They need the imports. They want to do the exporting. So that the region is very important in China is the central production network, the central country in that region that will protect it from wider um, Western decoupling if that was to increase, for example. Well, Nisha, thank you for joining us today and sharing your thoughts on the uh, focus. Oh, God help me. What a mess. <laughs> I like a yeah, simple no, world. I like a simple world. The world is not world. getting any simpler, John. That is no. For sure. No, indeed. So that's why we need podcasts like yours doing a, a, such a great job. Thank you very much for that. Anyway, and to our audience, thank you for tuning into the Focus Podcast. We hope that you found today's discussion enlightening and thought-provoking. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to us on social media. You can find the Focus on Facebook, referenced on the John Bruni and Sage International LinkedIn pages, and on Twitter or on the Sage International website at sageinternational.com.au by clicking the media drop down menu and hitting podcasts and please leave us your comments on inquiries at sageinternational.com.au don't forget to subscribe hit the like button and or leave a review on your favorite platform my thanks to our stalwart production team of malcolm hughes and neil spart join us again next time as we continue to delve into the most pressing current affairs issues of our time until then stay informed and stay engaged I'm John Bruni, and from Adelaide, South Australia, you've been listening to The Focus. Mm -hmm.